This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We turn now to Venezuela, where two prominent leaders of the right-wing opposition, Leopoldo López and Antonio Ledesma, were reportedly taken from their homes early this morning by security forces. Both men were already under house arrest. This comes as a tension is escalating in Venezuela after voters went to the polls Sunday to elect a new National Constituent Assembly, which will have the power to rewrite Venezuela's constitution. The right-wing opposition accused President Nicolás Maduro of attempting to consolidate his power. According to the official tally, at least 8 million people, or 40 percent of eligible voters, cast ballots Sunday despite an opposition boycott. On the same day as the vote, at least 10 people, including a candidate, died during widespread violence and protests. On Monday, the Trump administration placed sanctions on Maduro, barring all U.S. individuals and firms from doing business with him. This is National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster. Maduro is not just a bad leader, he is now a dictator. The United States stands with the people of Venezuela in the face of this oppression. We will work with our partners to hold accountable all those responsible for the escalating violence and ongoing human rights violations. The president promised strong and swift actions if the regime went forward with imposing the National Constituent Assembly on the Venezuelan people. On Monday night, Venezuelan President Maduro criticized the new U.S. sanctions. Why am I being sanctioned for facing fascism, hatred and intolerance, for not letting Venezuelan oil and our natural wealth fall into the hands of the magnets who finance Mr. Emperor Donald Trump? That is why I am being punished, to defend the natural resources of Venezuelan land, which will never again fall into the hands of the U.S. imperialism. That is why I am being punished. Well, to talk more about the situation in Venezuela, we're joined by two guests. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, we're going to George Chicarella Mar. He's the author of Building the Commune, Radical Democracy in Venezuela, as well as We Created Chavez, a People's History of the Venezuelan Revolution. He teaches at Drexel University in Philadelphia, previously taught at the Venezuelan School of Planning in Caracas. And here in New York, we're joined by Francisco Rodriguez, chief economist of Torino Capital. He's the co-author of Venezuela Before for Chavez, Anatomy of an Economic Collapse. Under Hugo Chavez, he headed the National Assembly's Economic and Financial Advisory Office. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, let's begin with our guest here in New York, Francisco Rodriguez. Can you describe what's happening right now in Venezuela? Right. Well, right now in Venezuela, we have a political crisis, essentially. The government is deeply unpopular. Uh, the, the country has been hit by an economic crisis. Maduro's approval ratings have fallen. Uh, in the latest poll surveys, they come out below 20 percent. So he still has the support of about a fifth of the population. Uh, but, however, most Venezuelans want him out, uh, and, and as typically happens when you have such economic deterioration. Um, so there are several constitutional procedures in the Venezuelan constitution whereby you could have, for example, early elections, a recall referendum. And the opposition tried to push for a recall referendum uh, and was unable to do so. Uh, some courts controlled by the government basically stopped the recall referendum uh, last year. So the opposition has been calling for early elections or another way out of this. Uh, instead of doing that, the government actually decided to press ahead with the Constituent Assembly. And the problem with the Constituent Assembly is that the government actually uh, designed its own rules to elect the candidates, and designed rules that were very biased in its favor. These rules, for example, gave uh, an urban municipality with many voters the same type of the same number of representatives as rural municipalities, where the government controls the majority of votes. It also uh, allowed about a third of the delegates to be elected from lists uh, of sectoral representatives. Uh, and it wasn't very clear where those lists were coming from. So the opposition decided to boycott the elections. And, in fact, uh, the people — so turnout in this election turned out to be basically an indicator of the government's strength. Um, the government claims that 8 million persons — the Electoral Council claims that 8 million persons came out to vote. Uh, that's not a very credible claim. Uh, we did some independent polling, uh, exit polling, and we actually estimate it was about 3.6 million persons. Uh, in the last election that you had, the last kind of, um, uncontested election in terms of the results that you had, Maduro got about 5.5 million votes. It'd be very difficult to believe that he's actually regained two and a half million 
million votes uh, in the context of one of the deepest economic contractions in world history. Venezuelan GDP is now uh, set to shrink by about 35, 40 percent by the end of this year. Uh, that is the deepest economic contraction in Latin America, and it's the type of contraction that is typically seen only in countries that are undergoing wars. Well, when you say um, that the the 40 percent figure is questionable, I mean, uh, were there as an actual vote tally? Isn't, mm -hmm. isn't there a way to tell for sure whether that many people voted or not? Um, well, no, no, there's, there's no way to tell for sure, in the sense that the Electoral Council is controlled by the government. Uh, there are four government representatives, one from the opposition. Uh, he actually was not present in the announcement. So uh, we really have an, an announcement of a number of— uh, well, there was a decision, by the way, by the opposition to boycott these elections, and that, uh, that, that gives us an additional problem, because the opposition didn't have witnesses. Typically, when you participate in an election, you have witnesses, and you can con contest the vote. The opposition didn't have that. So all that we have is an announcement of turnout by the government, and we really don't know how credible it is. What, what I can tell you is that we carried out some independent exit polling uh, in order to try to assess what the turnout was, and we got a turnout figure of about 19 uh, percent. And, you know, if you think about it statistically, uh, as with any polling, there's a confidence interval. Uh, so that, that number could have been 22, could have been 23, maybe it could have been 25. It couldn't have been 42. It, that's essentially statistically impossible. Well, George Chikara. Hello. I'm wondering your assessment of what's been happening in the last few days, uh, especially with uh, with this vote uh, over the weekend. So I think it's undeniable that Venezuela is in a deep and sustained economic and social and political crisis, which has more recently become an institutional crisis. Since the Venezuelan opposition took control of the National Assembly, you've really had this kind of deadlock within the institutions and a tit for tat between the executive judiciary and the National Assembly controlled by the opposition. And then this has been coupled with these sort of really violent street protests um, periodically through the last few years and over the past few months, taking more than 100 lives. And so we're talking about a situation in which the government was being asked to do something to help break out of this crisis. And this was one of the solutions that was put forward, or one of the possible solutions. In other words, to try to bring people to the table, to get people together, um, to work on a revision of the Constitution in a way that might help to break out of this crisis. And I think that's a very difficult prospect, because the causes of the crisis are deep um, and are grounded in deep economic realities. Um, but the, the goal of the, of the government was to put forward a kind of legitimate process. And unfortunately, the refusal of the opposition to participate in this election to boycott it. Um, this is a, st a strategy that has hurt them in the past, as with the 2005 National Assembly elections. Um, and this time, what they're trying to do is to delegitimize a process entirely, in other words, an electoral process that they could have participated in, um, and rather than attempting to move forward with more destabilization in the streets, which seems to be the, the chosen strategy of the opposition running up in the run-up to the next presidential elections next year. Well, I, I wanted to ask you about that opposition, uh, because we the reports that uh, most of the commercial press here in the United States are showing of what's going on in Venezuela is of people protesting in the streets and uh, and scores of people being killed. Uh, but the there's very little reporting on who is being killed and who is doing the killing. Uh, there are some reports out of Venezuela that as many as, as 20 people have been burned, uh, have been publicly burned by opposition figures. Uh, I think uh, the last one was Orlando uh, Figuera on May 20th, was, was burned in the streets, uh, as, as thought to be a Chavez supporter. What, what do you know about who is actually involved uh, in this violence? Is it the government against the protesters, or is it, in some cases, the protesters against the Chavistas. It's certainly both. Um, of these more than 100 deaths, those, you know, those that we know the causes of, they're pretty evenly split. Some are dying at the hands of security forces. Others are being killed in and around the protest by protesters. These are often violent blockades in which people are not even able to get to work. And when they try to get to work, they're often attacked. And if you look too much like a Chavista, which is to say you look poor or you look dark-skinned, you're much more likely to be attacked. And in these really brutal cases recently, to be, you know, to be burned publicly, to be lynched. And you've also had these, you know, this constant campaign of sniper attacks, which have cost several lives. Um, you've had people attacked, police recently attacked with bombs. And so we're talking about, really, a battle in the streets. It's not a question of protesters simply being repressed by the government. It's a real battle in the streets, in which the government is actually very hesitant, often, to use force, because it knows it will be tarred as repressive. And so that's why these protests have gone on for so long. And if you ask many people, in particularly important neighborhoods, they want the protests gone, and yet the government does not want to be too heavy-handed with these protests. So it's really been this long, uh, sort of, political war 
war of attrition in the streets. Um, and it's, it's something that requires a solution urgently um, so that we can get to discussing the real economic causes of the crisis and moving forward. Would you agree with that assessment, Francisco? Oh, I definitely think that there's a confrontation. I agree that the violence is not only one-sided. I agree that there's violence coming from the opposition. It's very difficult here to come up with tallies. And even, you know, in the case, as the other speaker was pointing out, uh, there are snipers. I mean, what do we know about who these snipers are? Are they the opposition says that they're government snipers? The, the government says that they're opposition snipers. The reality is that when there is political uh, violence of this type, you're not going to be able to find out what really happened until you have a truth commission, you have investigations, you kind of find I can understand the process that led to it. So I don't, don't disagree with that characterization. Uh, I probably would disagree with the idea that the government has not been heavy-handed. I mean, the government has been—there you know, there are a lot of—well, uh, there are allegations, of course, or even the very kind of serious allegations about torture. But there are things that the government has definitely not allowed, which would be allowed in a normal democratic society. Uh, the whole district of Libertador, which is the district of central Caracas, is a district in which opposition demonstrations cannot occur. Uh, so the government does not allow that it allows the demonstrations to occur in the region of Miranda, because there's an opposition governor there, so they have less authority. But once they get into Caracas, which is where the government buildings are, they don't allow them to come uh, to go into the city. Uh, is, it, is, is, is it true that sometimes the protests have turned violent? Yes. It's also true that generally in a democracy uh, and in any well-functioning you know, society with some type of uh, rights of expression, people should be able to demonstrate before government buildings. They should be able to demonstrate that they are against the government. People in Venezuela don't have the right to do that. And I think that the concern is not just a, a concern of security. I think that, that, that there are very serious limitations that are being put on Venezuela's political rights. But I would get back to the basic issue, which is that the basic limitations come on Venezuelans' electoral rights. Uh, the fact is that Venezuelans had the right uh, to decide whether they wanted to revoke their president, according to the Venezuelan Constitution. When President Hugo Chavez faced that type of contest in 2004, he said, I'll go to the referendum, and he won the referendum. So people voted in favor of Chavez. Uh, but in the case of Maduro, he has not allowed the referendum to go through. And all of the um, pretexts that have been put for that are really very poor. There's just nothing even resembling uh, a, a, a normally coherent argument about why it was that the referendum was stopped. Uh, the government alleges that there was fraud in the collection of signatures, but they point to signatures which were allegedly fraudulent, which had already been accepted from the tally. And there were enough signatures, even excluding the fraud, the, the presumed fraudulent signatures, in order to get the process to go forward. Uh, but nevertheless, the government stopped it because there's a reality. And, you know, this, this is something that I don't think anybody would contest right now. Uh, Maduro would lose a presidential election. The government would lose an election right now, according to every single poll. I mean, the polls that in the past said that Chavez would win, now are saying that Maduro would lose by a three-to-one margin, by even a four-to-one margin. Uh, and the government knows that, and that's why the government doesn't want to hold elections. But once we get to restrictions on, on the ability to elect your leaders, we're really talking about a backbone of, of, of what we understand as democracy. George Chicarella, would you agree with what uh, Francisco Rodriguez is saying? Well, it's a very quick slide between the ability to recall your leaders, which I agree is actually one of the hallmarks of the Bolivarian process and one of a, a sort of a rare phenomenon in the world. Uh, slide from that and the ability to elect your leaders. There's never been any kind of restriction on the ability to elect the Venezuelan leader. What there has been is an expansion of electoral rights and electoral freedoms and, and the ability to participate in more direct ways in recalling leaders. And I, I would like to have seen a recall referendum. The opposition was very half-hearted when it put forward the, you know, the, the proposal. Um, and has not pushed it entirely. And the Supreme Court, of course, not Maduro, but the Supreme Court stopped that process um, on the basis of these claims of fraud. But the reality is, you don't slide from that into saying that you've got some kind of dictatorship when I can't recall President Trump, when, you know, when you've got several leaders in Latin America who are less popular than Nicolas Maduro. And no one is asking when we can recall Enrique Peña Nieto in Mexico. No one is asking or referring to the, you know, to the, the leaders of various other countries as dictators simply because their term has not been completed and Maduro's term is completed the next year. There will be elections. Any, uh, any constitution and any constitutional reform that comes out of this assembly will go to a public vote. Um, and so we're talking about a country that's had more elections, more verified, clean elections than really anywhere else on earth in the past 15 to 20 years. Um, and it's really, it's really difficult to hear uh, anyone, and much less the Trump uh, regime, refer to this as a dictatorship. Uh, we're going to go to a break, then we're going to come back to this conversation. George Chicarella Mar is with us, Drexel University in Philadelphia. Francisco Rodriguez is with us here in New York, chief economist at Torino Capital, co-author of Venezuela before Chavez, Anatomy of an Economic Collapse. This is Democracy Now! Back with them in a minute.
This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, as we continue to talk about the situation in Venezuela, I want to turn to CIA Director Mike Pompeo talking about Venezuela last month at the Aspen Institute. Anytime you have a country of as large and with the economic capacity of a country like Venezuela, America has a, uh, a deep interest in making sure that it is stable and as democratic as possible. Uh, and so we're, we're working hard to do that. I, I, I'm always careful when we talk about South and Central America and the CIA. There's a lot of stories. So, uh, so I, I want to be careful with what I say. But suffice to say, we, we are very hopeful that there can be a transition in Venezuela. And we, the CIA, is doing its best to understand the dynamic there so that we can communicate to our State Department and to others, uh, the Colombians. I was just down in Mexico City and in Bogota week before last talking about this very issue, trying to help them understand the things they might do so that they can get a better outcome for their part of the world and, and our part of the world. That was CIA Director Mike Pompeo uh, talking at the Aspen Institute last month. Uh, so the United States, so he's been going around Latin America talking with key leaders there about what to do about Venezuela. Uh, Francisco Rodriguez, your sense of the role of the United States in all of this, because uh, we always are seem to be portrayed as an observer right, rather right, than as a participant right. in the process. Uh, well, the U.S. has taken uh, a pretty active role and, to a certain extent, a unilateral uh, position, in the sense that the U.S. has been pushing for very strong sanctions on Venezuela, and they've imposed sanctions on leaders. Well, of course, we know from yesterday the sanction on President Maduro, it's more than anything symbolic, but they've also imposed sanctions uh, on a number of Venezuelan government officials. This is a policy that comes from, from the Obama administration. And now there's some discussion in the administration about imposing economic sanctions on Venezuela, uh, maybe an oil embargo. I mean, all of these things appear to be on the table, and even though they haven't been announced yet, uh, they are under discussion. Um, the, the U.S. has also been coordinating with other countries in order to try to make these sanctions at least a bit multilateral. So on the sanctions that were imposed on government officials, these are uh, sanctions basically not allowing U.S. firms, uh, either persons or individuals, to do business with them, and they have the effect of freezing the accounts that they would have in the U.S. Uh, there were announcements by Panama, by Colombia, by Mexico that they would collaborate with uh, those sanctions and, and that they would enforce them, that, in fact, they would also freeze the accounts of those individuals. Uh, so the idea is to uh, cut off uh, the money in the accounts of, uh, up until now, individuals in government, but this is something that uh, could extend to uh, PDVSA, which is uh, the firm that generates most of the, nation, of the nation's revenue. And, and I think that it could have a, a pretty serious effect on the Venezuelan economy. And, George Chicarello, your response to this uh, Pompeo, uh, uh, the words of Pompeo and the U.S. role, especially the CIA? I mean, I think it's entirely unsurprising, and it, and it is a continuous role. I mean, this is not something that really changed dramatically under Obama, from Bush through Obama and into Trump. What we've seen is a desire to have an active role in removing uh, Chavista government from power. The question has just been how to do so most effectively. There was a coup in 2002 backed by the Bush administration, um, and, uh, you know, and it failed. It was, it was you know, a, a kind of a disaster for the opposition politically. And so then the Obama administration continued to fund those very same coup leaders, continued to fund people involved in that coup and right-wing anti-democratic elements, and to do so openly. And so it's no surprise to see this happening now and to see the CIA uh, expressing its open desire to be involved, because this has been the role for so long. Um, and I think uh, any question of sanctions is really only going to help Maduro. It's only going to help stabilize politically the legitimacy of the Maduro government, in part because uh, being attacked by the United States is really a, you know, a, you know, only burnishes the credentials of someone as an anti-imperialist, but also to be attacked by someone with such low moral credibility as President Trump um, is, is really a gift to any political leader, um, because you're being attacked by someone with no credibility and no really no ability to say anything about anyone, much less Nicolás Maduro. George Chikorelamar, what about the arrests last night of Leopoldo López and Antonio Ledesma? Both were under house arrest, but we see the video in both their cases of them being taken out of their homes by, uh, I guess, it's Venezuelan intelligence. 
Yeah, I think it's important to realize and to remember that these people were under arrest. They had been shifted to house arrest. Um, they've been charged um, with a, a number of things, from conspiracy to inciting violence in the streets. And they represent, really, the conservative right-wing fringe of this opposition movement. Um, now, whether we, uh, you know, whether the evidence is there for them to be continued to be held or to be convicted, to have been convicted, is a question. But they've been charged with serious crimes. And I think, I think the category of political prisoner is used very broadly in Venezuela to apply to things that, you know, people would be in prison for in many other places. And these are people who have been involved in, you know, undeniably involved in the coup, and undeniably involved in mobilizations in the streets that have turned violent and have continued to encourage these mobilizations. Um, and so I think it's, it's really no surprise to see this happen right now. I'm not sure that it's going to help the political situation at all, um, but it's not quite as simple as the narrative that's being put forward of people being grabbed and seized out of their homes. These are people who are under arrest, in one case convicted. And so uh, we need to be very clear when we're talking about what's going on. Um, but, you know, moving forward, the question is really going to be how to uh, deal with these questions, how to get people together to discuss this situation. And I'm not sure that, um, that these kind of, uh, you know, actions in the middle of the night are going to help uh, the opposition come to the table. And also, briefly, could you talk about the criticism of Maduro from the left, uh, not just from the right, that there are some uh, folks uh, formerly part of the Chavista revolution? For, uh, for instance, Luisa Ortega, the uh, attorney general, who has now become a, a, a outspoken critic of, of the current uh, 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 policies of the Maduro government. Could you t uh, what's the nature of the criticism from the left? Sure. I think there are a wide range of what you could understand to be critics, left-wing critics of the Maduro government, some of these figures, of course, that you've heard about. But also, um, I think more importantly, on the grassroots level, um, you know, we need to be very clear about the fact that this is a, this is a revolutionary process that has brought in a great range of participatory uh, social movements and, and revolutionary grassroots organizers. Um, but for the most part, these are people that have not broken with the government, but are really trying to push and figure out a way uh, to press the government to the left, to, you know, encourage a, a, re a renovation of the commitment to grassroots democracy. These are people who organize in these things that are called communes, where people are directing the man and managing, you know, the, the, you know, production on the local level and local grassroots democracy, um, and trying to figure out a way to leverage this government, to press it to the left, and to do so in a very difficult situation of crisis in which Maduro has been erratic, to be perfectly clear. On the one hand, supporting grassroots organizers, supporting this sort of uh, ferment at the grassroots level while trying to stabilize uh, the political and economic system in ways that really um, that are really distasteful, I think, to many, turning to foreign capital, turning to foreign corporations for investments. Um, and so there's this tense contradiction that's going on uh, amid this crisis. And many on the left are dissatisfied, of course. Many Venezuelans are certainly dissatisfied with the state of the economy. Um, and so, you know, the question is really how to stabilize the economy, how to move forward, and how, from the perspective of these left-wing sectors, how to deepen this process, how to you know, create a situation in which Venezuela can become more socialist, not less, and not turn back simply to uh, the old neoliberal capitalism that failed in the past. And, friend Francisco Rodriguez, how you think the country should move forward. I mean, you're a former Chavista. You were head of the national budget, uh, the congressional budget well, no, office under Chavez. I, I was appointed by, with the support of both parties, actually. It was a bipartisan uh, appointment. Uh, I, was, I was appointed by unanimity of the National Assembly back in 2000, yes. Mm -hmm. But are fiercely critical of Maduro right now. How uh, do you, I, I am, I'm critical. I'm critical of Maduro's economic policies. I uh, actually participated in an attempt last year, led by UNESUR, uh, to try to advise the Maduro government in order to improve economic policies. There were a set of recommendations that were handed to, to the administration. Uh, and as a Venezuelan, uh, definitely the first thing that I want to see is for my country to be able to address these deep economic issues. I mean, there, there has been a very serious deterioration in living standards. There have been uh, increases in, for example, infant mortality rates, maternal uh, mortality rates, uh, uh, indicators of hungry body weight loss. I mean, there are a number of things that are really going wrong in Venezuela, and I think that there are, that that there are changes in economic policy uh, that could be carried out in order to address these issues. I mean, for example, Venezuela has a completely dysfunctional exchange rate system. Uh, the government sells dollars at an exchange rate of ten bolivars per dollar. Uh, I, nevertheless, in the black market, these these are sold for over ten thousand bolivars per dollar. So the government is trying to 
maintain a completely unrealistic price of foreign currency, and that just generates an incentive for corruption. There are, there are uh, completely uh, excessive uh, controls on uh, any type of economic activity in Venezuela, on just a basic price-setting mechanism. Uh, there, there haven't been any mechanisms. And, well, nothing was done in order to save during the oil boom. So the country, when oil prices started going down, basically didn't have international reserves. It didn't have uh, anything to use as a buffer on, uh, on the way down as other countries. There have been a lot of errors in terms of economic policy. There are still things that could be fixed that could make things better. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us. Of course, we'll continue this discussion. Francisco Rodriguez, chief economist of Torino Capital, co-author of Venezuela Before Chavez, Anatomy of an Economic Collapse under Hugo Chavez. He headed the National Assembly's Economic and Financial Advisory Office. George Chicarello Mar is professor at Drexel University in Philadelphia. His books include Building the Commune, Radical Democracy in Venezuela, and We Created Chavez, A People's History of the Venezuelan Revolution. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we'll look at what's happening in Korea and here at home with a former presidential candidate, Green Party presidential candidate, Dr. Jill Stein. Stay with us.